Hello and welcome. My name is Lee. You are listening to the Taking Liberties podcast. Uh, this week we're episode 21 of season four and I'm joined by Zeev in Melbourne. G'day. And we're going to talk about uh, two topics. We're going to talk about the Victorian Euthanasia Bill uh, that is, uh, I don't know if it's actually before Parliament. Anyway, it's up for uh, a vote sometime in the near future. And we're going to talk about discretionary trusts and why Bill Shorten hates small business owners. So um, let's start off with the euthanasia bill. Got to go for that edgy, you know, like political sounding thing because that's like yes. the in thing, you know, you got to go after the person. So um, let's talk I've about... I've got uh, an effigy of Bill Shorten that yes, we can burn yeah, after the yeah. program. I posted one to you. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like burning a good effigy to get the yeah. things going. So let's talk about the euthanasia bill. So uh, currently there's a, uh, in the Victorian Parliament, there's discussion of a euthanasia bill where they are uh, essentially it's it's pretty complicated i don't think we'll go into all that we can talk about the details broadly but i think generally the it's it's probably too complex to talk about all the details but essentially they're trying to legalize euthanasia there's a three-step process of consent you know and going to doctors and getting doctors opinions and uh, and all sorts of different things, uh, and the end result is you, you know, can then a doctor can then help you or give you the just the setup and the prescription drug in order to end yeah yep. to end your own life. So it's not yep the doctor themselves doesn't actually you know press the the syringe. It's actually you administer it yourself. Um, yep, unless you're unable to do so physically. Yes. Yep. In which um, case they will help literally. Yep. Yep. Um. So. Well, I guess we could maybe start off talking broadly about kind of euthanasia from a libertarian perspective, and then maybe if there's any specifics. So, uh, how about you go first, Steve? Uh, what, what what are your sort of broad like? What do you think libertarian has to say about the topic of euthanasia? Okay, I'm going to avoid making any puns about youth in other countries, uh, Asia, and so on. Let's just get that out of the way now. It was an icebreaker. We needed Z- uh, Vickers here to make all the grim jokes about uh, I know. terrible subjects. Yes. <laughs> about euthanasia, exactly. All right. So we, with that icebreaker out of the way, um, <laughs> well, I guess, I, I guess libertarianism in itself doesn't actually have much different to say about this topic of the right to life, so to speak, than other political philosophies. At the end of the day, I think the vast majority of political philosophies accept that uh, life is a precious thing, that murder is wrong, and that uh, at some at some point, taking a life without consent is absolutely murder, and that, um, well, not at some point, at every point, that is murder, the definition of it, and, and that where euthanasia lies in that spectrum, whether it's classed as assisted suicide, uh, whether suicide is regarded as immoral and wrong, uh, in itself, um, and whether assisted suicide is regarded as murder are debates that you can have in practically every belief system uh, anywhere. Uh, and I, I don't think that uh, libertarianism in itself has a unique uh, answer to that question uh, as a political philosophy. So um, that would be my first statement. Uh, second statement, um, well, yeah, I mean, that you could say that suicide is, is wrong and immoral and it's so on, um, something that you shouldn't do. But uh, I think from a libertarian perspective, I think you would say that suicide is uh, a matter for the individual. Uh, if, some, if someone wants to um, uh, kill themselves, then it should not be uh, illegal. Uh, uh, it does not seem to me as if uh, punishing that person if they fail to kill themselves, is really going to help them in any way, yeah. shape or form, or help anyone else. Um, in, in that regards, it's, I mean, I'm not aware of suicide being actually illegal or punishable in any states. It's usually people being in the vicinity of people who are trying to commit suicide. So that's kind suicide of where, where it's been targeted. So, you know, if, mm-hmm. you, you know if, if somebody ends their life by swallowing a bunch of pills and you happen to be in the room, then mm-hmm. you might, from what I understand, that people have been charged with you know, uh, some sort of crimes of, of assisting that person's death, even if they had nothing yep. to do with it. So from what I understand, a lot oh. of these, the people who do this kind of thing will say, okay, say goodbye to their family. The family leaves the room and then mm. they, they, they take the drugs. So, mm. you know, which well, is... it's not, it's not so much being in the same room. It, it, what the crime is in, in Australia is a suicide pact, an agreement to 
uh, jointly or commit suicide or to assist someone else in committing suicide. If that person does it by themselves of their own means and volition without your assistance and you don't help, well, you, you are under no obligation to save a person drowning uh, under Australian law, nor are you under any obligation to save a person who is trying to commit suicide. But if you have helped them, and what that help amounts to is a matter of debate, of course, um, then yes, you may be liable for participating in a suicide pact or for engaging in assisted suicide. Yep. Um, now, yes, so that's that's where the law is at the moment. Uh, assisted suicide is uh, illegal. Uh, suicide pacts where two people agree to commit suicide together and assist one another are illegal. So if they both survive, they will actually be subject to criminal charges um, or if one survived. Uh, so, and I guess the uh, legislation right now in Victoria, the first of its kind anywhere across Australia, is saying, well, look, let's make assisted suicide legal uh, if a person has been judged by a medical practitioner or a doctor uh, to be in the last 12 months of their um, terminally ill life, yep. right? Now, uh, the criticisms that I've read from the um, conservatives about this is, well, look, how can you judge when someone is 12 months away? It's actually quite an uncertain judgment to make. People have lived for years and years when that judge, when people, have, when doctors have told them you've only got 12 months or what have you to live. So that's, that's one criticism. Um, I mean, I think yeah. that the, the, intent, the intent of mm. that sort of provision is to stop people who are suicidal from trying to do this. So, like, I think, um, I mean, this is not sort of a libertarian point. This is just sort of a general mm. d discussion about the peop why people have an issue with euthanasia is they're worried that people are going to start taking advantage of euthanasia uh, to commit just, you know, they're just got depression, they've got all sorts of, all the normal mm. things that cause people to decide to commit suicide and then they use these sorts of systems. And I mean, that's not totally out of the realms of uh, sort of reasonableness to worry about that. In Western Australia, there was a case of a, a woman who went to, I think it was Mexico to get some, one of the drugs that Dr. Philip Nitschke, who's a, a, a famous mm. euthanasia advocate, you know, she mm. went to Mexico and downed a bottle of this stuff because she, I think she had, you know, years of depression Mm. And uh, then suffered like a horrible death, slowly dying in Mexico in a Mexican oh, hospital. You know, so oh, it's dear. like you know, it's not it's not totally unreasonable to sort of want to try and keep this sort of system mm. out of the hands of those who are just depressed. Um, yeah. Well, then, then again, we have this judgment call to make, uh, which you flagged about assisted suicide. When is it right to actually help someone who wants to kill themselves? Yep. Kill themselves. Yeah. That's that's a that's a really um, complex question, I think. And I, if if you took it at, at from one extreme libertarian point of view, you might say, well, look, I mean, if that person has voluntarily expressed a wish to die, and they are of uh, sound mind, then uh, you should um, help them off themselves um, in any circumstances at all, and um, yeah. if, by if whatever the means they service. wish. If that's what you want to do and that's what they want to do and he, they've signed a consent form or whatever, um, then, you know, that's one vision of what libertarianism might allow. Uh, another vision is, well, look, uh, these are very, very um, uncertain choices to make uh, that uh, uh, could, if allowed, uh, if, if we take that kind of attitude, so to speak, we might start licensing murder. Um, or something that comes very close to it by the people who are um, helping, um, assisting suicide. This is one argument that conservatives raise, I should add. Um, and then you might say, well, if to allay that concern, we should really only deal with the people who are at the end stages of their life um, and, and at the end stages of a terminal illness, more exactly. We shouldn't allow people who just feel bad about themselves to ask someone else to... Uh, help them in their own life because that's getting to a very ambiguous uh, question about whether they are in fact uh, maybe competent or not competent mentally to make that judgment yep. you might say yeah i mean i, I think from, just to sort of go to go to the sort of the libertarian perspective i mean really mm. it'd just be you would sign a contract if you can sign a contract yes. 
to have somebody be give you, you know, for a medical service. You essentially mm. you go to a doctor and say, I want you to prescribe me this thing or I want you to administer mm. this thing. Where's Take this shotgun and blow my brains well, out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's purely, you know, mm. so I think in that regard, libertarianism on the ex- bottom line excludes... And- the mm. possibility of involuntary euthanasia. So, mm. you know, your grandmother has dementia, she is suffering, yep. you don't have the right to sign a contract Correct. on her behalf to have her be administered yep. on lethal injection. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that we can definitely draw the line there and say involuntary euthanasia is wrong. Um, yeah. I, I find it hard to imagine who would think it is right apart from Nazis, basically. Well, and uh, oh, progressives in the... 19 early oh, yeah, 1900s yeah, yeah, yeah. those guys yeah um i mean yes. I, I think who came so, pretty close to being fascist anyway but go on one of the few sensible things that ever came out of colin barnett's mouth was about <clears> this topic where he said that you know one of the things that will happen is you'll have people who are an edge case where they may be administered just a bit too much pain medication mm. and that just hastens the end and i think mm. that's that's a like an okay status quo so maybe there are people who wouldn't having explicitly give consent, but they're clearly on the edge of death, then mm. they're kind of, and, and you're just literally giving them enough pain medication to just kind of tip it over. But it's not, mm. you're not like, oh, you're going to live for 20 years here, have an injection, you know, like it's, which, mm. I mean, Christian conservatives bring that up as a possibility. I think mm. they, they'll point to places where in Belgium and in Netherlands, it's usually the two places they point to and say, well, yes. in these countries, there are people who are being, uh, you know, given lethal injections without their consent. Um, mm. That's. I mean, it's a reasonable thing to be concerned about. Um, mm. I guess that then it comes down to the specifics of the sh- of the system. I think they would then argue that the underlying cultural thing is that you're putting pressure on people to kill themselves. Mm. I mean, that's harder to measure. It's harder to know how much that will actually be a thing. Um, mm. And I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's impossible to sort of promote very good end of life palliative care and also have voluntary euthanasia like i don't think it has to be one or the other like i think you can have both uh, i agree I think, with that i think if you left this system to a to the market per se like you would have there's lots of doctors who are not just me like oh you want me to give you an injection yeah well, let me just go get the syringe like there'll be lots mm. of doctors who will be reluctant to do this sort of thing who want to provide counseling and certainly mm. on a professional level like as an ethical thing like mm. it's you know i mean you are bound under all sorts of ethical obligations uh, just mm. by nature of your profession, I'll be the same when I become an accountant, you know, and mm. doctors are the same. And, and you just sort of make it an ethical requirement to sort of lay out the sorts of uh, safeguards mm. that that should go along with this sort of thing. So I, I think there's, there's not necessarily like you have to sort of say, well, there is always a slippery slope and it will end up with, you know, every old person over the age of 50 just be given an injection mm. as a matter of due course. Like it's, it, it's, it's... Yeah, it depends on the principles that yeah, you accept exactly. as valid. And, 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 and the norms uh, that come and that arise out of this change in system, because at the moment we don't yeah. have those, we, we have very different norms because it's not... So the norm would be, okay, you've got two or three days to live, you're not conscious, you're in mm. pain, we're going to just administer like just a little bit too much morphine and you're just going to slip away in the middle of the night and you know everybody will say goodbye yeah. and everybody knows what's going on, it's wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But it's not mm. explicitly said. That's that's probably the norm in a lot of places. Already, they change it to be yeah. more explicit to say, well, you can explicitly say, in the case of voluntary euthanasia, okay, we're, this is what we're going to do. Then you'll have a different set of norms, uh, and we don't know what those norms will be. But I, I mean, I suspect most people are very uncomfortable with like just killing people off because we can kill them off. Like yes. most people would say, if you can, if you want to live your life, and we can help administer the sorts of treatment that will help you enjoy the last stages of your last months of your life, that's okay. Let's do that instead. Um, yeah. So you well, want to say something and I think I, I, I interrupted you. No, oh, no, okay, I'm, right. I'm just nodding my head and just <laughs> saying right on, Lee, I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, look, it's, it's hard for me to be full-throatedly in favour of the radical liberty, libertarian position here um, because it's um, dealing with a very uh, uh, very very difficult issue I mean can you just sign away your right to life so to speak in, in every case in every situation and even if you're a perfectly healthy person can you just say well can you just take a truck and run me over thanks I mean and 
I'm just trying to think of humorous examples in as much as that's possible because this is such a grim topic. But um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I, I don't know uh, if I uh, have fully made up my mind on this one. Um, and I guess I, I obviously lean towards the perspective that um, if, if, if someone is terminally ill, then I'm much more sympathetic to the um, pro-euthanasia argument. Um, if they're not, I guess I'm... I wouldn't say that I'm sympathetic to euthanasia. Uh, I, I would say I'm a little... I'm, I'm getting pretty sceptical at that point of the idea that, that, that we should help that assisted suicide is a good thing for that person, in principle. Yeah. Um, whether that means it should be illegal, I'm not yeah. sure I'm excited. Um, I, I anyway. I'm personally more open to kind of more radical libertarian mm. ethical positions just because I think that preserving kind of bodily autonomy, which is, you know, I'm sure every person who's pro choice and knows that I'm pro-life is just like, what are you even talking about, you idiot? But like, I, I think... The, once you're out there, once you're out of the room and making decisions for yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, well, but yeah, like I, I think, I think. In principle, I may agree with that, but it, as a matter of ethics, aside from political philosophy, I would think that it would be uh, profoundly wrong for someone to help someone of perfectly sound physical state to kill themselves. Sure, even I, if, I, yeah, I agree. leaving aside whether it's illegal or not. Yeah, yeah, so leaving. Yeah, yeah well, if we if we're not talking about legality, we're talking about morality. Well, then yeah, I, yep. I, I wholly agree. Like. I, I mean, even as somebody who's I've gone through a lot of mental health issues myself and has been suicidal, you know, like I, I think that uh, I mean, I, I would never judge somebody for committing suicide because I understand what it's to, what it's like to be like that. Yeah. But that's that's not to say that I would encourage them to do. I, I would say, don't. Yeah. but like in terms of like what the law should be, I'm I'm more tolerant of the notion of having something more radical just because I uh, I don't like the idea of the state telling you how to. You know, when, or when you can't take a substance that may or may end, may or not, may or may not end your life. Like I think, people condemning it, great. Church, you know, providing all the, the help in the world to not do it, great. But saying you can't, even if you're suicidal, you can't take that substance because I just think no, no, because I, I don't think that's how you change people's minds. Uh, I agree and, with that. You know, I think there's probably a lot of awful ways to die. That if you're genuine suicidal, like, you know, let them take the thing. But. That, that's that, I think just in terms of like s steps as they are like if, if if this from what I can tell you know if this this Victorian law goes into into effect I'd be like okay with that and just leaving it to that like you know I'm, I'm, I can it tolerate it like, yeah like I yep. think it, it, it looks like a pretty decent system uh, I'll put a link into the description of the podcast for uh, if anybody wants to get a good uh, description of the exact kind of spe specifics of the law um, yeah. As we said, it's a three-step process where it goes to the doctor and then it goes to a committee and then it goes back to the doctor. So, well, I, I, it, it's in uh, the patient indicates that they wish yes. to they wish to access euthanasia, and they have to say that three times. That's what Lee means. It's not something that the doctor or anyone. Oh no, no, yeah, yeah. So the doctor appro anyway. approaches uh, the patient appro approaches yep. the doctor. The doctor makes an assessment. Then yes. there's an independent assessment, and then. There's Another that. success, and then there's a final request. Yeah. Anyway, um, I think we've reached the 19-minute mark, so yes, let's yeah. uh, segue. Let's, let's, okay, so let's yeah. talk about something which is less depressing, uh, yes. but still depressing. Uh, because <laughs> we're talking about discretionary trust people, we're going to talk about tax. I think it's, yes. Uh, so Bill Shorten at the Labor conference, I think it was a couple of weeks ago now, uh, made this brand, you know, grand pronouncement that the evil of the discretionary trust must be thwarted. People are evading tax. This is an mm. intolerable thing. Uh, let's, let's Putting talk about accountants it. out of business. That's yeah, what well, I, know, I know. You know what am I going to do for a living if this happens? Yeah. So yeah. basically, for those who don't know what a discretionary trust is, essentially, a discretionary trust is like a legal instrument, for lack of a better phrase, where you can put assets and, and money and all sorts of things into uh, essentially a, a separate entity from which you then have a trustee who dis, dis, you know disperses the, the funds to the beneficiaries. So if, if uh, Zeev and I set up a trust... Uh, which had a lot of shares and it was generating dividends, then at the, you know, whenever, every year, the, the trustee could say, okay, I'm going to give Zeev $10,000, he's going to give me $10,000, you know, th that sort of thing. The benefit of the discretionary trust is particularly for 
planning taxes. If you've got a family where the husband's earning an absolute butt ton of money and the wife is earning nothing, you can essentially give her more income to make use of the progressive taxation. So if you only earn a certain amount, you only get taxed at a certain rate. Uh, so it allows you to kind of structure your tax affairs. And what Bill Shorten thinks is so horrendous is that they're... Um, is that the the minimum you know basically you get taxed at your income rate so you know if, if uh my you know if my wife wasn't working you know, we gave her uh, you know gave her fifty thousand dollars she'd be taxed at 32 cents in the dollar where if i was earning a hundred two hundred thousand dollars i'd be getting taxed 47 cents in the dollar or actually more than that so anyway essentially it allows you to organize your affairs so you pay less tax which is great bill short thinks that's terrible he wants to set a minimum rate of 30 percent and he's a tool for doing that and yes <laughs> Steve, All right. Go for it. Well, um, I think that's a, a fairly good uh, summary for uh, the audience of what uh, the discretionary trust is about. Uh, I think we can more or less uh, discuss why he wants to do it. First of all, first of all, he, he makes the argument that this is that the discretionary trust system, more broadly, the tax system is uh, driving inequality, quote unquote, in Australia, and that um, by reforming discretionary trusts and by effectively raising taxes in this way, uh, he will be uh, taking from some in order to give to others and therefore make Australia a more equal place. Uh, now, I guess the uh, things that we can say there are that actually inequality isn't so bad um, because inequality is a sign that people are creating things, creating wealth, being successful and in the process helping others. So, I mean, businesses that grow are growing because their customers are buying their products. So I guess that's the first, for, for example, and therefore accruing income and that's a sign of inequality. Um, cave people living with rocks and spears and the like are all fairly equal in terms of their income, but um, that doesn't mean that they're very well off. Yeah. So inequality, inequality in itself, we might say, is not a problem. Um, I guess the other point to mention is that, look, I mean, trusts uh, are there to minimise tax liabilities, and they do it in ways that... Uh, many Australians cannot access uh, and people are driven to access trusts because of our taxation system yeah. and its problems. Yeah. So instead of looking at it as a problem of trusts uh, that people access and have to pay lawyers and accountants like you and I to do that, um, uh, let's look at it as a problem of a taxation system that is driving people to pay lots of money and spend a lot of time uh, to escape. Yeah. Uh, if we actually lowered taxes, then the benefits of escaping the taxation system would be lower. Yeah. Um, and the amount of time they would spend on their own businesses uh, would be higher. Yeah. So in turn, they would be more productive. Yeah. Uh, lawyers be, would be out of work and gosh, I would love <laughs> that. Uh, but. I don't think more. that's true. I don't think that's true. <laughs> no, there's always no, room no, always... for you and me. Hooray. Now, <laughs> but leaving that aside, I mean, the point is that um, people would be more productive. Yep. Uh, actually, tax revenue would likely increase because people would spend more time creating wealth and less time worrying about ways of avoiding taxation liability. Mm. And uh, in the process, uh, people would be better off. So... I hope, anyway. Yeah, so I mean, there's uh, the basic criticism of Bill Shorten's attack on taxes, uh, on ra attempt to raise taxes to fight inequality, yeah. I think. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, this is much the same as uh, like corporate tax and, and the notion of these evil tax havens like the Bermuda or whatever or Ireland where low co they've got low corporate tax rates so everybody's domiciling their businesses in those countries to, to, uh, to fix that. And of course, the OECD and all these other uh, high-taxing or people in favour of higher taxes want to try and stamp that out because they, they don't like the fact that people can move their business elsewhere. Uh, and as you're right to say, you know, the way you fix that is just make it easier for everyone. Um, I mean, I think there, there there is one good genuine criticism about the nature of, of uh, 
uh, of discretionary trust, which you actually raised and something that I think it's the Australia Institute of some lefty idiots. Um, you know, they, they say that normal people can't, well, they say normal wage earners, well, they say normal people, but it's normal wage earners and salary earners who can't access it. So my wife, and I'm sure you and uh, and your wife, you know, you guys can't access these things because you earn an income where if you were to start a business, and, and I'm sure most small businesses would be set up this way, where you set up a trust and then you can then allocate your tax affairs. So it's not, it's normal people can do this. It's just not normal wage earners. And that's a, that's an important distinguish, uh, distinction to make is that there'll be lots of people who own businesses who have income generating assets they are the ones who are going to be making use of this. Uh, and oh, I should say, I mean, if, if, you know, we come across, in my firm, we come across purchases of business and uh, you know, two out of three, a dime a dozen cases, m most of them, I would say, I mean, most people purchase through trusts. Yeah. Most people use a company trust to uh, open a small business and these are people who are not wealthy people. Yeah. These are, uh, these are people with um, very little other than you know, a few tens of thousands in savings, uh, rolling the dice at a new business, half of them or more probably fail in the first year and then yep. they go back to what they were doing before and exactly, yeah. they're not very well. No. And as we talked uh, about before we we started the show, I mean, one of the other reasons people use it is, uh, is, um, is like it, it also helps shield assets from bankruptcy and another thing. So, you know, in, in one of the classes I had, I think it was last year, when last semester when we talked about it, it was like, you know, if you've got a family trust dispensing to the children and then one of the children get divorced, it's not like you're going to lose the family home as part of yep. that uh, divorce settlement. So there's lots of reasons to have trust. It's not just evil, sneaky tax dodgers, you know. Yes. Um, and of course, we would exactly. recommend, uh, uh, what was it, um, Kerry Packer's great statement. I'll, I'll, again, I'll probably put this in the link about, uh, you know, uh, minimizing anybody who doesn't minimize his tax needs his head read. Uh, is a great <laughs> line from Kerry Packer because in front the of the, the is, Senate. Isn't using their tax dollars, uh, our tax dollars very well. Yes. Uh, yeah. So yeah. classic line, always worth saying. Um, Absolutely. But yes, it's, it's, it's a thing for normal people. It's not this, it, I mean, sure, the wealthy probably do use discretionary trusts a lot, uh, but they'll, you know, if you, <laughs> you know, do, they've got lots of ways of doing other things as well. Like it's, not, you know, it's really like this is making it harder for people who don't have access to like really good lawyers and really good accountants and enough assets to then create other forms of structures because it's not just discretionary well, trusts. Mean, uh, uh, this is exactly right. And can I say this? Um, this actually will not hurt the highest income earners. Yeah. Uh, this, this is a, this is this. Um, Australia's taxation system has three levels, right? So it's initially, it's I think it's 19%. Um, uh, yes, there's so a tax-free threshold. Yep. So then it's 19%. Yep. Then it's 30%. Uh, 32. 32. Uh, then it's 37. And then it's 45 or 47, I think. All right. Well, but I really, like, when, once you're in this 47 bracket, like basically yep. you're paying a bunch of extra stuff as well. So you're sure. going to be paying over 50% tax. Tiers. Okay. Four tiers. Inter okay. Um, okay. So you've got this four-tier system, and the point I'm, uh, I wanted to make was very quickly um, that um, once you, um, oh, bugger, I've, I've lost so my. Um, just a clarification: it's 19 percent, thirty-two point five, thirty-seven, which is when yeah. you're earning more than eighty-seven thousand, and then forty-five percent when you're over one hundred and eighty. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm on it. Yep. Now, um, this this reform that Shorten wants to put forward is that any distributions from a discretionary trust will be taxed at a minimum rate of 30%. Yep. So, in effect, what that means is that uh, if you have enough income to, um, and I'm talking about, if, if you can distribute sums in the tens and tens of thousands of dollars yep. to your beneficiaries, so in the hundreds or whatever, and some people can, uh, in the hundreds of thousands, uh, this actually won't hurt them that much yep. because uh, it, it, the people who it will hurt are people at the bottom rung, the small business owners who have just started out and maybe they have a total income stream of 100k that they're distributing between two people and it will hurt them somewhat. It will hit their hip pockets the hardest. So it's actually hitting the, the bottom rung, rung of small business owners. Yep. Um, yeah. uh, oh, and, and one last thing I would say, look, if we're going to tackle inequality in this country, uh, let's acknowledge that uh, inequality 
is a big problem because uh, Canberra's bureaucrats, on average, earn more than the rest of the population. Yes. And uh, let's start with Canberra's bureaucrats. And, uh, <laughs> and um, let, let's also point out that a lot of people um, do acquire wealth partly because of uh, privileges granted by the government. Yes. Uh, and perhaps we can look at those privileges and take those away because those are, are problematic forms of inequality too. Anyway. And on that note of, attack, of attacking Canberra bureaucrats, something that I'm sure libertarians hate the notion of, uh, yes. we will end the show. Thanks for joining us, Steve. Uh, and I'm sure our regular Canberra... Well, he's not quite a bureaucrat, but a normal Canberra <laughs> resident. I guess we'll be back with us next week. He's uh, in Newcastle, I think the week so uh you couldn't join us but um yes thanks for joining us everybody make sure you subscribe to us and like us on itunes and, and youtube uh and uh, feel free to share us and all the rest of it and uh yeah we'll be back again next week ciao